At Maverick Public Relations, growing your influence is their specialty. NPR works with remarkable companies in the cannabis industry to deliver exceptional results. Experience big agency expertise and outstanding client service delivered by seasoned and knowledgeable experts. Connect with Maverick PR today and move your company to the next level. Visit them today at www.themaverickpr.com. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And welcome back once more to the Cannabis Podcast. If this is your first time, an especially warm welcome for you. If you're interested in cannabis information about smoking it, enjoying it, or learning about it, you might have come to the right place. We're going to spend the next 30 or 40 minutes talking about those types of things. Remember, this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. This episode, wow, lots of stuff to talk about. Less than three weeks from the BC Cannabis Summit, they've had an agenda update, pretty well all finalized. We'll tell you about the highlights. We welcome a new subscriber along for the ride. Health Canada announces some big changes to processor licensing for dried flour. Ontario has changed their mind about white-label cannabis. We have a new look at cannabis and the munchies. On Cultivar Corner, it's premium BC bud from BC Black's Mission Valley Landslide. And guess what? I made my first purchase of medical cannabis, thanks to the folks at The Veteran Farmer. All of that and more on episode 94 of the Cannabis Podcast. And before we go too far, let me welcome a new subscriber, Lloyd. Welcome along for the ride. He joined just in this last month. So now he has access to all of the Cultivar Corner visuals, which give you a pretty good look at the weed (laughs) and sometimes the effect it has on me. Plus, something else that happened to the Cannabis Podcast this last week. I joined a new network. I'm now part of PodCon X, a collection of cannabis podcasters. And with the power of that network, you may have noticed when this episode started, there was an ad. Well, that's part of joining PodCon X is we can grow the cannabis podcast. Advertising has been the fiber that has been the growth of our world since the beginning of time. The first time somebody painted a message on a rock to to say, wheel $10, (laughs) that's when advertising began. It's a fact of life. And I think it's a pretty exciting time. I'm really happy to be a part of the PodCon X team Looking forward to what it means as we move forward. It, part of the fact is I've moved to a new distributor. It's now Simplecast. And it's allowed me to do some, I think, better things on the website. Easier access for you, easier access for me. And I hope you don't mind hearing an ad or two. Because, after all, that's what makes the world go round. From the Cannabis Infused Studio in the Clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Cannabis Infused, of course. I always try to do my part with the Cannabis Podcast. Speaking of doing my part, it's coming up. April 20 is coming up soon. We're getting close to 420 of this year, 42022. And here in Kelowna, that of course means the BC Cannabis Summit. They've updated their final agenda. And here's some of the highlights. It's going to kick off at three o'clock on April 20th. That's when you can start registration. The welcome reception at the rooftop patio which I believe is going to be one of the consumption lounges, but perhaps after the opening ceremonies, I don't know for sure. That starts at 4. And then at 6.30, there's the BC Bud Tender Craft Cannabis Awards. That's also happening on the rooftop patio. There's been a lot of people that I know voting for those craft awards, just exclusively BC Craft Cannabis up for awards. So that'll be very cool. Moving into the Thursday, April 21st, Destigmatizing Cannabis to Create Jobs, Economic Growth, and Tourism kicks off the morning, followed by a BC government policy update. And then the trade show kicks off, and in the morning finishing, Resetting the Cannabis Act with British Columbia Members of Parliament. That will be an interesting session to attend. As we move to April 22nd, the Friday, It's going to kick off with an access panel talking about the future of medical cannabis and then retail and marketing looking for some creative compliance and the future storefront, what that might look like. 
At 11 a.m., there's a government panel on diversity and inclusion through leadership, hiring, procurement, and marketing practices. And an another innovation panel, the future of craft cannabis farming and processing. And the final piece of that is uh, 1 o'clock, the communications panel ending cannabis stigma in the digital age. That's the panel that I'm going to be a member of. Alongside of that, Indigenous government leadership will be presenting. And then at 2.15, it's the closing panel, Women and Cannabis, the Next Generation of Leaders. That's the agenda in your mix about all of that. Of course, a whole bunch of cool people talking about craft cannabis, how we can make it better, how we can get it better, how we can access it better, all the things that will just make our world with cannabis better. Looking forward to it starts April 20th. That's the BC Cannabis Summit here in Kelowna at the Hotel El Dorado. And now our first story. This is from Stratcan.com. Health Canada will soon begin granting sale licenses to all micro and standard processors during the initial licensing process without the need to submit a sales amendment application. That change will begin April 19th as part of ongoing efforts from the federal regulator to improve the cannabis program in Canada. Wouldn't that be nice? The changes mean that existing licenses do not con concurrently authorize the sale of dried and fresh cannabis products will be reissued with amended conditions within the next 90 days. Those license holders already in the queue for a sales amendment will be prioritized. Once their license has been amended, and 60 days have passed after submitting a notification of new cannabis product for any dried or fresh cannabis product, license holders will be able to sell those products into provincial markets pending local approval. A notice sent to license holders notes this decision is based on a lower risk associated with producing dried and fresh cannabis products. The goal is to reduce the regulatory burden on license holders and allow them to get products more quickly to market, says the memo. This represents a significant change for the industry, as the application process for a sales license amendment can take several months. Although the 60-day notice will remain in place, the removal of the application process should really speed things up for license holders, says Kylie Baudry, CEO of Parkland Flower, an Alberta-based microproducer and the president of the Alberta Cannabis Micro License Association. I think this is excellent. It's excellent for the industry and a move in the right direction. This is huge. Baudry says she thinks it could also tie in well with emerging farm gate and direct sales models in provinces like Ontario and British Columbia. I think it opens up for micros who had the intention of doing farm gate sales. It gives them the ability to do that. And with Ontario and BC opening up for direct delivery, this will make a huge difference. I can now package it up and have it in a retailer's hand shortly after curing. She says she also understands why Health Canada is limiting these changes only to dried and fresh cannabis, given the extra regulatory requirements of additionally processed products like extracts, edibles, and then topicals. Well, this is still a big step forward, Baudry notes that more changes are still needed, especially at the provincial end when it comes to selling products in those markets, especially when it comes to insurance requirements. George Smitherman, President and CEO of the Cannabis Council of Canada, an industry organization representing several licensed cannabis producers, raises similar concerns. This would seem to be a big breakthrough for especially the fledgling license holders in our space, he says. What we've been looking at is some of the constraints further up the supply chain for license holders with access to provincial markets and taking a deeper dive at some of the recall insurance requirements, which are a significant impediment for smaller players trying to crack the provincial distribution space. So this is a breath of life for some, but we can't pretend that the provincial distribution space isn't complicated in its own right. That story from Stratcan.com is Health Canada decides to change some regulations for dried fresh producers. And my thanks to Ez at the store who pointed me at the next story, which is all about cannabis appetite and the dreaded munchies. And this story is from naturalhealthservices.ca. Please help me to not get the munchies. This is the rallying cry for many of the patients that doctors and cannabis educators speak with at Natural Health Services. Unfortunately for some, the munchies aren't necessarily one of the erroneous myths around cannabis. Appetite stimulation does have its place, and certain strains have been known to bring it on. Not all do, though, and some terpene cannabinoid profiles may even decrease appetite. To this end, cannabis is a tool to be used mindfully and intentionally. A little research will alert you to strains that typically will increase or decrease appetite. Check sites like leafly.ca and lift.co 
where you can enter your search term and be rewarded with applicable strain names. Your licensed producer's website and your LP's customer service reps may be able to help you depending on what they have in stock. Note the terpene humulene and the cannabinoid THCV are reputed to decrease appetite and are included in this particular profile. Health Canada does not mandate that levels of anything other than THC and CBD be noted. However, many licensed producers are recognizing and responding to patients' preferences for further terpene and cannabinoid profiles. We are becoming a sophisticated user base, Canada. So just how does cannabis fuel the urge to eat or not to eat? That is the question. Endocannabinoids. Chemical compounds that the body produces are intrinsic to the body's regulatory responses. From stress to pain to appetite to digestion to metabolism. We know that the phytocannabinoids in the cannabis plant mimic our own naturally produced endocannabinoids with similar effects. Dr. Keith Sharkey, Ph.D., from the University of Calgary explains, endocannabinoids regulate how quickly food moves through the intestines. They also help to digest food. While THC stimulates the appetite centers in the brain, the impulse is driven by the cannabinoid system, which controls behavioral triggers in the brain related to eating. In essence, when we ingest THC, receptors in our brains trigger the release of hormones that can, with certain strains, increase our hunger. Add to that the pleasure-enhancing qualities of THC, which can make food taste exceptional, read, This is the best chocolate cake I've ever eaten. I think I'll have another. And you may be eating more than you would like, in hindsight. Again, this is often strain-dependent, and as always, not all individuals will react the same. Personally, I have only come across a couple of strains that make me unusually hungry. This could be due to my preference for more sativa-labeled strains, as well as adding CBD to whatever I am ingesting. Many strains I've used do seem to act as pleasure enhancers, however. There are at least two different sources of appetite. Homeostatic feeding is eating because your energy stores are reduced. This is signaled, at least partially, through your cannabinoid receptors in your gut, and through their regular gut-brain connection, they let your brain know. But Dr. Sharkey explains, there's another type of eating called hedonic, or pleasurable eating, when you don't need to eat that much, but you do. It may come as no surprise that THC can work on both the homeostatic and hedonic systems. In case you're considering taking cannabis and the munchies off the table, you should know that many studies show regular users of cannabis tend to be thinner. Many theories exist around why this may be, including it's possible that cannabis users are out enjoying life more. They may dance to the music in the grocery store. They may be in less pain and better able to enjoy a more active lifestyle. Or... Cannabis users may be more mindful around tasting and chewing their food, which helps with digestion and assimilation. Or, the weight-causing stress hormone, cortisol, may not be released to the same degree. After all, stress and the resulting cortisol release may cause your body to hoard fat and burn fewer calories. Often, cannabis, especially with CBD, may be stress-relieving. Or it may be cannabis potential to help you tune into your body more during exercise, thereby helping to achieve the desired effect. Or, certain uplifting strains of cannabis, say with a limonene terpene profile, may produce a feeling of being uplifted and energized, allowing you to be more active. Or, regular cannabis use has been associated with better blood sugar regulation. Or, cannabis' ability to help with sleep provides more energy the next day. Or, that the cannabinoid THCV or tetrahydrocannabivarin, or the terpene humulene can be appetite suppressants. It's exciting that none of these are mutually exclusive. Cannabis, when ingested mindfully and intentionally, has been anecdotally shown to have all of these effects. In terms of obesity and metallic syndrome, the animal model evidence is equally hopeful. Dr. Sharkey's lab did a month-long study in which mice were given THC and then fed a high-fat diet. The result? Their gut bacteria was altered and they lost weight. Dr. Sharkey explains. People who are obese have different gut bacteria than people who are lean. We see the same in mice. We can reproduce this readily. Animals who were treated with THC, who lost weight, ended up with normal, healthy gut bacteria. Cannabis is not a weight loss agent, but what it does to the metabolism is fascinating. It may explain why cannabis users are not as obese or why they are thinner than the regular population. In said study, the THC did not have any effect on the size of mice who were already a regular weight, contributing to the notion of cannabis's part in maintaining homeostasis. But it did cause the obese mice to lose weight. 
the theory being that THC causes changes in the gut microbiome of the obese that helps regulate weight loss and digestion. How the THC might normalize gut bacteria is not yet understood, but many studies have produced the same results independent of factors like age and gender. From personal experience, I can tell you that being of relatively normal weight, I may keep it that way by making sure that as general habits, I balance my THC intake with cortisol stress-relieving CBD, access limonene-rich strains. For me, this terpene works as an energy enhancer during the day, as well as a mild antidepressant which keeps emotional eating at bay. Continue to look for strains with more THC, V, and Humuline, and encourage my licensed producers to include this information on their website. And that was written by Kate Shane. Community Outreach Educator of Natural Health Services, and again, the website for that is naturalhealthservices.ca. Excellent job on that, Kate. You raised many, many valuable points. And thanks for that excellent description from Dr. Keith Sharkey about the endocannabinoids and how they contribute to digestion. We now are a whole lot smarter than we were before. Are you ready for liftoff? Don't miss Canada's number one cannabis conference and trade show, Lift & Co Expo coming this May 12-15 to to Metro Toronto Convention Centre. Level up your industry intel at the Lyft Cannabis Business Conference. Connect with movers and shakers from across the cannabis industry and preview new products and services from 250-plus exhibitors. Plus, everyone loves Lyft & Co. Expo's prizes, live music, and more. Visit liftexpo.ca for tickets. That's liftexpo.ca. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. Welcome to another edition of Cultivar Corner, and today we are doing another BC product. In fact, we're going to the Mission the mission area of BC for Mission Valley Landslide. Now, this is another BC Black product. They're putting out a whole bunch of stuff. And I want to pull up the details here so I can talk about Miracle Valley Landslide to Joint Venture Craft Cannabis. That's the people who are doing all this wonderful work. And, and I kind of figured it out now. I had somebody explain it to me the other day uh, between JVCC and BC Black. And BC Black is kind of a collection of a bunch of different growers, and JVCC is the packaging division. Now, they used to have uh, what we were calling tuna tins, where you had a little bit of nitrous oxide in that, kept it nice and fresh. The problem with that was once you opened it, there was really no way to seal it again. So it didn't really give a real solid seal, uh, solidly carrying on with that seal. (laughs) Weird terminology there, I understand. (laughs) But they moved to these black Mylar bags. And I got to tell you, I'm not a fan. And the reason I'm not a fan is you might even be able to see that I have cut off the top of this package. (laughs) If I spend more than three minutes trying to open a package of cannabis, out come the scissors and we slip the top. That's what happened with my Miracle Valley landslide. Now, it was really attractive when I popped this onto my scale and saw that I was sitting at about 3.7, 3.8 grams, so a little bit overweight. Really nice buds. I'm going to give you the description of it in just a moment, but let me take a peek with the jeweler's loop, and let's see if we have these vast trichome fields. Let me give you the brief description of it first. Let me pull that up. Landslide from Miracle Valley is an exclusive bred by Lit Farms. Landslides a cross of lava cake and mac that brings its loud, obnoxiously pungent strain that is sure to please. Contains a deliciously sweet flavor profile that puts out exceptionally smooth and cakey terpenes. Some users that smoke this strain say it smells like freshly baked goods. Not sure I'd go that far with it. Let me pull out the jeweler's loop, get the light on the right side. And take a look at the frosty trichome fields. Lots of beautiful color. This is a really nice, pretty green that these buds are. Lots of rose pistols in there as well. Lots of red, a little bit of orange. And lots of trichomes as well. Fairly vast fields. Not seeing a lot of amber, which I kind of would have expected in that this is definitely an indica-leaning hybrid. But looks good nonetheless. 
and more importantly, what does it smell like? There's definitely some fruity and sweety notes to this guy, which I think is where the reference to the baked goods comes. Mm, when you dig deep down in there, you can pick up some of the uh, earthiness from the mirror scene as well. Oh, definitely lots of fruity flavors. Really, really enjoying that. So what's the deal behind Miracle Valley Landslide? The chirpings involved, let me pull up the website. Now, they do have lots of good information on the BC Black website for Landslide. BC Black Landslide crafted by Miracle Valley. And we've already heard that it is lava cake and mac that brings out those loud, obnoxiously pungent strain odors. Ideal for work, after work. I, 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 let me rephrase that because that's not what it says. <laughs> it says the strain is ideal for after work or lazy days off. So this may not be something that you want to do before you head off to work, <laughs> considering there is some indica leadings on this hybrid. The terpenes, always important for us. So 3.47 is the terpenes in the package. Uh, actually, the package that I have says 2.21% terpenes. So a bit of a discrepancy between what's on the web and what I'm at in the actual package. And the THC on this is sitting at 26%. And the operative terpenes, the three primary terpenes, uh, are limonene, farnesine 2, and transcaryophylline. Now, I'm not surprised to see farnesine there. Because in my mind, anytime I'm getting some of those sweet, fruity, candy notes, there's got to be some farnesine in there. And I think that is the case in this one. Really sweet. So I do get a sense of what they're talking about with those baked goods. Let's get the vaporizer fired up. And I've already got the joint ready. See, I do know how to roll a fairly good joint. <laughs> and here we are once again. I have done the proper preparedness in that I haven't smoked anything yet so far today. This is going to be my wake and bake. And here we go. This is Landslide by Miracle Valley. Uh, my current staff pick at the store. And really enjoying this one. A cross of lava cake and Mac Miracle Alien Cookies. I will get to the two-fisted stage in just a moment, but let me start with a joint. Mmm. Oh, and right off the bat, as soon as you fire up that joint, there's some of those sweet notes in the, in the flavor itself. Burning smooth. Nice white ash. Not seeing a lot of darkness in there, which is always really nice. A smooth smoke. Tasty. Hmm. So let's give you a little bit more about Miracle Valley. The motley crew of misfits in Miracle Valley combined decades of experience growing true legacy strains with the most advanced techniques and top-of-the-line equipment. Their state-of-the-art facility is nestled in the heart of picturesque Mission, B.C., where Jason and his team still use the same small room, hands-on approach they dominated the legacy market with for years and years. You can trust Miracle Valley's flower offerings with even your most discerning customers. Well, you are my most discerning customer, <laughs> so I'm entrusting it to you. <laughs> and isn't it nice to again see so many of these legacy growers coming out of the out of the black market, into the legal market, and growing some really good weed? Okay, vaporizer is ready, and I've already got some happy eyes going on here. <laughs> I can already sense that they're starting to take over. So now let's do my traditional two-fisted toking. Oh my. As soon as you put that vaporizer and, and the heat of that brushes across that Miracle Valley cannabis, and boy, do you get those sweet notes. There's got to be farnesine definitely in there. The flavors they say that you're going to note are some citrus, and that would be the limonene, the apple from the farnesine, and the pepper from the transcaryophylline. Mm -hmm. Little bits of each of those notes. A little bit of that citrus on the inhale. And a little bit of that farnesine, that apple taste on the exhale. More importantly... What's the interaction with my endocannabinoid system? <laughs> Hoping for a good bow, and here it comes. 
I just love that as I'm about to describe it and wham, <laughs> there it goes. <laughs> in reference to the story I told on the last episode, we were chatting at work yesterday. <coughs> about our party. And now, <coughs> as I mentioned, it was pretty easy to see that some people were really, really stoned. And I had it confirmed to me that many others could not tell whether if I was stoned or not. I didn't really look any different. So I guess I raised that point that if you are looking at this video and hoping that you're going to see my eyes start to go into that really, really deep stoner stance. <laughs> they don't go there very much. When I say I got the happy eyes, I can feel those happy eyes behind my pupils. And it's kind of hard to describe it even more than that, but yeah, <laughs> the buzz is coming on. Hmm. Really happy that we got so much good weed being grown in BC now. And I'm hoping that you have opportunity to access some of this great BC weed where you are too. Um, it'd be really nice to be able to, to share and, and, and have you experience the same thing. So once more, <coughs> at 26% THC. Okay. I was about to comment on the fact that I don't feel it getting really deep. And it seems like my endocannabinoid system likes to contradict my words. <laughs> as soon as I make statements like that, then, then I start to feel that a little bit better. Mm. I am still having a blast doing this podcast. And it is more exciting to me every day as more and more people give me feedback about uh, what they're enjoying about it and, and how they're enjoying it. I'm so happy that you are along for the ride. And I'm so happy that I get to share things like this Miracle Valley landslide from the folks at BC Black, 26% THC, 2.21% terpenes. Oh yeah, and I'm flying now. Mm, my two-fisted toking has once again <laughs> achieved success. And there you go. Again, the joint all the way down, or most of the way down. No black. Just a nice white ash, and see that one just fell off. Really nice fruity and sweet taste as we do it through the vaporizer. Mm. Since this is a day off work, I'm pretty happy about this. In fact, I think this could be ideal for my day off of work, and I'm just going to have a lazy day off. Miracle Valley Landslide from the folks at BC Black. Another example of some great weed coming out of BC. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And we go to mjbizdaily.com for the next story where Ontario Cannabis Regulator is reversing their decision to allow white label retail deals. The Cannabis Retail Regulator in Ontario is set to reverse course on its recent decision to ban retailers from creating in-house brands and white label products. The move, if implemented, would allow cannabis stores in Canada's largest market to continue signing agreements with producers to create such products. Industry officials welcomed the reversal. In February, the AGCO announced its intention to prohibit retailers from co-branding cannabis or accessories with producers. The move would have meant products branded with the retailer's name or white label products produced under a specific brand were off the table. Existing white-label products could have continued to be sold, but the provincial retail regulator said it expected retailers to exit any current agreements and not enter any new agreements with producers once the updated standards come into effect. The new rule was to take effect at the end of June, along with other regulatory changes such as updated rules surrounding material inducements from licensed cannabis producers. However, the AGCO now will be announcing an amendment to these standards permitting retail licenses to enter into agreements with producers for store brand or white label cannabis products, according to the email from an AGCO manager. The regulatory reversal on white label products is a result of input from the cannabis sector and reflects the AGCO's ongoing commitment to engagement with stakeholders. Several Canadian cannabis retailers with Ontario operations 
had already launched or planned to launch white label or house brands including High Tide, Sessions Cannabis, and Fire and Flower. The AGCO's move to ban those white label products came as a surprise, said Mimi Lam, co-founder of Ontario cannabis retailer Supret, which has white label products for sale at its stores and others. Lam said she was part of the group of cannabis industry stakeholders who pushed back against the AGCO's white label position. With some retailers already having established white label partnerships, she said, the requirement for operators to get out of white label products by June 30th would have had material impacts to businesses on both sides of the equation and has material impact to future business as well. Lam said she was glad the AGCO took industry stakeholders' concerns into account. So there you go. Even the big boys can sometimes change their mind, and Ontario is reversing their decision about white-label cannabis products and brands. And let me finish this episode with a shout-out to the Veteran Farmer Organization, especially Trina, who is who I dealt with specifically over the last few weeks. And as you know, especially if you heard a previous episode, the Veteran Farmer is there to help veterans, first responders, and civilians access medical cannabis. When I interviewed Mitch Grant back in episode 90, he intrigued me. As you know, if you've been a listener to this podcast at all for any length of time, I've been a consumer of cannabis for about five decades and a significant amount of cannabis, I'll admit, that I smoke. And over the course of those five decades, I've developed a few ailments and issues with arthritis primarily and my knees and my hands and, you know, the occasional issue of not being able to get a good night's sleep. And Mitch intrigued me that because if I'm consuming this cannabis and I'm buying this cannabis, I may as well, if possible, find some way to make this a, a medical situation, which it is, but I hadn't really validated that, I guess, in my head before. It made me reevaluate that. So I went forward with it. Thanks to Trina. Big shout out to Trina. She helped me with all of the details, setting up the appointment with the nurse practitioner, uh, filling out the medical form, getting the medical documents to the licensed producers, which I chose. And it was an easy process. There wasn't a lot of stress involved with or for me in it, which is good. Although I now have access to medical cannabis and I could deal with that stress. <laughs> it, it, the strangest part for me, having gone through the process, I've heard stories before of people that had had you know, an awful lot of trouble getting it, especially when dealing with their family doctor. And this was somewhat of a remote connection. So I guess there, there wasn't that, I don't know, that, that fear, that, that stigma that, that hangs over that that personal relationship. Uh, but anyways, the process was really easy. And here's where it's really different for me. I never before would smoke a joint, and light a joint, roll a joint. <laughs> In case you haven't, uh, aren't aware, I have already consumed a little bit. So that's why I'm rambling a little bit here. But I never before differentiated or realize there was a difference between medicinal and recreational. Because now, there are times when I roll the joint and I say, it's time to medicate myself. And there are times when I roll the joint and it's time to have some fun. So I can clearly see that there is a medical and a recreational balance. But it's really different to be able to access that now. Now, the other thing I was most surprised with, and I'd heard this, it's really costly to be a medical cannabis patient in Canada. It ain't cheap. Not by a long shot. There was one provider I looked at, and that's why I didn't go with them. <laughs> they had an ounce, and it was $279 for an ounce of medical cannabis. Huh? <laughs> Where do you come off with those prices? Now, I ended up with uh, the provider that I that I went with. I went with Shoppers, and I went with Mendo. 
kind of split my prescription half and half across those two because I, I wanted a fairly diverse selection and, uh, and also some to be able to access some kind of primo stuff. And I found that. So in Shoppers, I got an ounce from Highly Dutch, their Amsterdam Sativa. Mm, very, very nice. And I still have some coming from Mendo, and that's going to be some Tommy's Craft Cannabis. Haven't had a chance to try the Tommy's Craft yet. So that will be interesting. It has been a journey. And a journey that I'd always thought of doing. I mean, if we back up four years, five years prior to legalization, when there was a plethora of gray market stores around the Okanagan. Literally, they were popping up everywhere. <laughs> and in each of them, you had to spend some time with some medical practitioner over a video phone call to give you the ability to buy in that store, to buy their membership. It was always kind of weird, but I mean, there were, there I was, and, and I went, went for the same things. It was the, the arthritis in my knees, my hands, and all those kind of things why I went forward, but I find it I'm not ironic, but some kind of some kind of weird that here I am, five years later, able to follow through with that and now have the ability to take this cannabis, and that is the the, the benefit of, of it, the cost a little bit higher, but I'm hoping the medical expense and the taxes at the end of the year will offset those costs. I've never had that ability before. So there you go. Um, Mitch Grant was the one who first got me thinking about it when we had our discussion about the veteran farmer. The veteranfarmer.ca is where you can go to find all your own information. Send a note to info at the veteranfarmer.ca if you want to ask them any questions. Turned out pretty well for me. And now I think it's time to medicate myself. From studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And if you ever have any comments about the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. And you'll, of course, find the links to all of the stories talked about today at CannabisPodcast.com. Now, that will be changing in the future with the move over to Simplecast. I'm going to be able to add those literally into the episode itself and going to make it a whole lot easier for you to access those links as well. Remember, if you would like to become a subscriber or you like what you hear and you feel like buying me a doobie, you can go to buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you being here. That's it for episode 94 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley... This was the Cannabis Podcast.